Urban planning shapes the cityscapes and community spaces that make up the built environment people share in their daily lives. Cheryl Case is the founder and executive director at CP Planning, and she's interested in adding another dimension to what goes into such plans, a better understanding of how space can affirm or constrain human rights. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, Nam. Great to be here. Uh, it's nice to see you in person, because I think we've only spoken online before, like on Skype and Zoom. Um, so your organization takes a human rights approach to community planning. What does a human rights approach to planning mean? Uh, so a human rights approach to planning means centering the lived experience of those who are marginalized, who don't have access at the moment to uh, the core, their core needs, which are affordable housing, uh, good jobs, and access to cultural services. So mm -hmm. in centering their lived experiences, we're centering, uh, producing outcomes that will help to better their access to those needs. Because I think when people think about planning, which is essentially like how communities are made, we don't think about human rights. Why should we think about human rights when we plan neighborhoods? Yeah, so we should think about human rights when we plan neighborhoods because um, in dealing with land, that's you know we're the foundation of uh, our economy, right? And so in planning the built environment, you're also planning access to uh, to jobs, to housing, and so these things are incredibly central. If you think about, you know, even to know that we're standing on stolen land, mm -hmm. right? So the human rights of Indigenous people to be part of this planning process, to have their cultural needs met, um, these are things that are recognized not just um, in Ontario via the Ontario Human Rights Commission, um, but also nationally, the United Nations acknowledges the human rights of Indigenous peoples and of all peoples to have access to um, access to affordable housing, to good jobs, and to cultural services. Um, so what would you say is the problem that you're trying to address? Yeah, so the problem that we're addressing is that marginalized people are not having their voices acknowledged. How would you define marginalized people first? Yeah, so marginalized people include those who are, let's say, you know, making minimum wage, um, those who are living in housing and they're paying 40, 50 percent of their income on housing and they're not able to afford food, right? And they're going to have to go to food bank and they're stressing over um, making ends meet at the end of the month, right? Um, so those would be, and, and you look at marginalized people, that would be a really great example. Of mm -hmm. course, we have people who are homeless um, who are even more um, marginalized. Mm -hmm. Um, folks who don't have opportunity to think about what types of job do I want to go into, right? There is a huge uh, lack of access, if you bring it back to uh, planning, mm -hmm. to have access to being a part of the planning process, right? Um, if you look at the chief planners across Ontario, they're not necessarily as reflective of the demographics that are being served, mm -hmm. right? In Toronto, we haven't yet had a person of color serve as our chief planner. Um, and uh, in terms of you know, the planning process and what we look at and prioritize, affordable housing has just not been at the top of the list um, because, again, the Mars people are not having their voices heard, um, despite the fact that they are very vocal, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, learning about how when we were planning the Eglinton LRT in Toronto, um, there were communities that were expressing the need for greater uh, prioritization of affordable housing. You'll see the same thing in Ottawa that you know the LRT is going to lead to gentrification. We need to be making sure that affordable housing is being planned. The same thing in Hamilton, same thing in Kitchener-Waterloo. People were expressing the need for affordable housing, um, yet we do not see any affordable housing plans established along these LRT lines. So help us understand why do we need affordable housing around transit? Yeah, so we need affordable housing around transit because you look at it um, in one level, right? So this is billions of dollars being invested into transit with the intention that it's there to help people move from point A to point B, right? So you look at this public investment, right? This is taxpayer dollars being used with the intention of helping people move from point A to point B. What you're seeing happen, though, is that that public investment is being privatized, where the people who own that property adjacent to the transit they're jacking up their rents. They're uh, you know, selling their properties to developers and developers are selling at market price the new housing. And so you know, these same areas are actually where you find oftentimes the highest volumes and densities of renters and lower income households. Right? So in Brampton, for example, along the transit line of here, Ontario, and um, they're planned to build uh, you know, denser transit along um, Main Street, is where you have the highest volume dens densities of renters. And, um, and so when you're building new development and there's no plans for affordable housing, you're going to have, again, the private owners jacking up the rents, selling, and then developers selling for market rate. And then you're going to see these renters now being pushed out and displaced. 
So the role of the city would be to advocate and to engage marginalized people so that the plan around that development keeps them in mind and, and allows them to stay in the neighborhood that they have known and loved for so long. So let's talk more about solutions. Uh, what are solutions that you're proposing? Yeah, so uh, city planning is really excited to be launching a project called the Roadmap for Redevelopment Plans to Confront Systemic Racism. Mm -hmm. So this project is uh, conducted in partnership with neighborhood associations and community groups and nonprofits across uh, Toronto, Peel, Hamilton, New York, Kitchener, Waterloo, and Ottawa. Um, all the cities that have had major investment in transit. Mm -hmm. And so in partnership with these nonprofits, we're operating something that we're calling inclusive neighborhood planning hubs. And so we're actually gonna be working directly with neighborhood residents to uh, build capacity and to build community uh, where folks are able to talk about their housing needs, mm -hmm. their housing interests, to build allyships with um, local homeowners who necessarily don't necessarily personally need affordable housing access, but they are invested in the well-being of their fellow resident, um, and to together build local strategies to build affordable housing in those neighborhoods. Well, these neighborhood uh, planning hubs, what would they look like and how would they work? Yeah, so the foundation of how this is working is uh, based on the work that we've been doing in Little Jamaica over the last two years. So with Oakwood Vaughan Community Organization, this is a wonderful association of local residents who are incredibly committed to their community. And so they are you know, a group of volunteers who meet every month. We meet every month and we review the project plan and we discuss, okay, how do we adjust and how do we adapt the project plan? Um, and that's, again, the, the local nonprofit who, who, who I work with on that. And so while we're doing that steering work, we are also operating um, local working groups. Mm. So we have a working group that's looking to explore establishment of a community land trust. That's a model where you're able to build and maintain affordable housing in perpetuity. Um, and we're also doing engagement with local um, homeowners, right? Because a lot of homeowners we found actually are really interested in building affordable housing. They just don't have the tools and they don't have the knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and they also don't have the support to help them carry through all the difficult conversations needed to get from an idea to execution on affordable housing. So that property owner outreach is actually incredibly important um, in, in our work. Um, and the other component of this working group is that we're gonna be engaging directly with tenants, folks who are most at risk of being displaced. Mm -hmm. um, and so as we build a community of tenants, uh, as we build affordable housing, we'll be able to actually direct for those tenants to have access to that housing so that they can stay in those neighborhoods that they've loved and uh, been a part of. When you said Little Jamaica, it was hard for me not to smile because Little Jamaica is such an important um, uh, neighborhood in the city. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first moved to Toronto, it was the first place that I went to to just try to find some community. Mm -hmm. um, we only have like a minute left, um, but uh, if this project achieves what you hope uh, it will achieve, what will a CP planning neighborhood look like and how many of them will there be? Yeah, I love that question. Um, so CP planning neighborhood will look like, you know, it would be people living in community, right? Right now, especially with COVID and with you know Zoom kind of uh, you know, that we're good for, that we're still dealing with, uh, people are stuck in their houses, and then you know they'll go out to an event here and there. Um, but to be actually engaged in your community and and to have folks in your community that you meet maybe every week or every other week, and you're doing not just you know uh, intentional planning work, but you're also having a lot of cultural opportunities as well, right? Because it's the people, people in Oakwood Vaughan, they deeply love their community. They love the residents in their community. And to be able to see that type of love um, expressed through practice and through continued um, collaboration, right? So it's not just the housing that would be built. It would be the flourishing of, of culture and of connections. Um, and that's, I think, what, what a CP planning neighborhood The community like. and the neighborhood flourishing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Cheryl, for your time. I learned a lot. We appreciate your insights and can't wait to see where your project goes. Thank you so much, Dom. Thanks. Great to be here. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.